Good afternoon. Thank you very much. I hope everybody's enjoying their meal. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome. For those of you who missed last evening's dinner or this morning's panel discussion on the Middle East, uh, I'm Steve Slick, and I direct the Intelligence Studies Project here at the university. And it's my pleasure today to introduce the conference's first keynote speaker, who I suspect actually doesn't need an introduction uh, to this crowd, but uh, he's going to get one nonetheless. Uh, it will be a short one, I promise you. Uh, very briefly, the, the University of Texas really bookends Bill McRaven's professional life. He graduated here in Austin with a degree in journalism in 1977, entered on duty with the U.S. Navy, and over the next 37 years led with distinction at every level of the U.S. Special Forces community. He retired last year as an admiral and the commander of the U.S. Special Forces Command. Now, of special relevance to this audience, was Bill's service on the staff of the National Security Council during the George W. Bush administration, where he helped craft a national counterterrorism strategy in the aftermath of 9-11. And of course, his leadership in organizing and overseeing the raid on Osama bin Laden's Abbottabad compound in May of 2011. And last January, Admiral McRaven was installed as the 11th Chancellor of the University of Texas system. Now, for those of you outside the University of Texas ecosystem, uh, hard to imagine, but there is life outside this. You should also know that Chancellor McRaven um, last week, or excuse me, two weeks ago, presented his strategic plan called Leading in a Complex World at a meeting of the University of Texas Board of Regents. I was there. It was a pleasure. It was a terrific briefing, and it's a, it's a wonderful plan for this important university system. Maybe not surprising within that plan as one of the chancellor's quantum leaps, where he's going to expect the university system to make great strides, is in the field of national security. The chancellor announced plans for a national security network that will connect and push forward the work that's already underway at more than 40 different centers across the University of Texas system. So I would encourage you all to, to watch this space. Uh, stay tuned to hear more about the UT National Security Network we look to all of you as partners in that, and you may consider this conference, this meal, this set of remarks as a down payment in that regard with more to come. I know certainly the people at the Clements and the Strauss Centers, the sponsors of uh, this week's conference, uh, we already feel a tailwind from the, uh, the system chancellor's support, and it's a wonderfully exciting thing to be part of. So please join me in welcoming to the stage Admiral Chancellor Bill McRaven. Well, thanks very much, Steve, as always. Uh, great to be here, great to be on campus. And uh, you know, I reside down on 6th and Colorado Street. And uh, as I tell Greg Finvez, any opportunity to get out from the middle of the city and come back to the campus, uh, even here at the AT&T Center, is, is always terrific. Uh, so Steve, thanks to, to you and to Willem Bowden and to Bobby Chesney for the great support from the Strauss and Clements Center. Uh, you really have pulled together an all-star cast. Uh, it, there are too many luminaries here to mention. Uh, but suffice to say, you know, having been here now for about 10 months and, you know, the, uh, the events you all have put on really do garner some of the very best and brightest from the intel community, from the, the national security community, so terrific. And again, it will be a great, uh, great start for our, our network for national security. Well, I've been asked to address uh, some of the changes <coughs> that I've seen since 9-11 and really give you a little bit of perspective on how we might move forward. Uh, first, I want to begin by reading some passages from the National Strategy for Combating Terrorism. It begins, the struggle against international terrorism is different from any other war in our history. We will not triumph solely or even primarily through military might. We must fight terrorist networks and all those who support their efforts using every instrument of national power, diplomatic, economic, law enforcement, financial, information, intelligence, and military. Progress will come through the persistent accumulation of successes, some seen, some unseen, and we will always remain vigilant against new terrorist threats. Our goal will be reached when Americans and other civilized people around the world can lead their lives free of fear, free of fear from terrorist attacks. There will be no quick or easy end to the conflict. At the same time, the United States will not allow itself to be held hostage by terrorists. Combating terrorism and securing the U.S. homeland from future attacks are our top priorities. 
This combating terrorism strategy focuses on identifying and diffusing threats before they reach our borders. And while we appreciate the nature of the difficult challenge before us, our strategy is based on the belief that sometimes the most difficult tasks are accomplished by the most direct means. Ours is a strategy of direct and continuous action against terrorist groups, the cumulative effect of which will initially disrupt over time, degrade, and ultimately destroy the terrorist organizations. The more frequently and relentlessly we strike the terrorists across all fronts using all tools of statecraft, the more effective we will be. The United States, with its unique ability to build partnerships and project power, will lead the fight against terrorist organizations of global reach. By striking constantly and ensuring that terrorists have no place to hide, we will compress their scope and reduce the capability of these organizations. By adapting old alliances and creating new partnerships, we will facilitate regional solutions that further isolate the spread of terrorism. Concurrently, as the scope of terrorism becomes more localized, unorganized, and relegated to the criminal domain, we will rely upon and assist other states to eradicate terrorism at its roots. The United States will constantly strive to enlist the support of the international community in this fight against a common foe. If necessary, however, we will not hesitate to act alone, to exercise our right to self-defense, including acting preemptively against terrorists to prevent them from doing harm to our people and our country. The war on terrorism is asymmetric, but the advantage belongs to us, not the terrorists. We will fight this campaign using our strengths against the enemy's weaknesses. We will use the power of our values to shape a free and more prosperous world. We will employ the legitimacy of our government and our cause to craft strong and agile partnerships. Our economic strength will help failing states and assist weak countries in ridding themselves of terrorism. Our technology will help identify and locate terrorist organizations, and our global reach will eliminate them where they hide. And as always, we will rely on the strength of the American people to remain resolute in the face of adversity. We will never forget what we are ultimately fighting for, our fundamental democratic values and way of life. I co-authored those words in early 2002, when I was a captain, as Steve said, working on the Bush National Security Council. For internal reasons, the strategy wasn't published until February of 2003. I believe the combating terrorism strategy that we outlined was relevant then, and I believe it is more relevant today. It is a strategy of direct and continuous action. It notes that there will be no quick end to the conflict. It notes that we must use all elements of national power. We must build alliances. We must leverage the international community. We will help the weak states who are afflicted by terrorism. We will use the power of our values to build partnerships. And if necessary, we're prepared to act alone to protect our interests. And it really does call out that we are fighting for our way of life. Now, lots transpired since I left the national security staff in June of 2003, all of which I think puts us in a better position to execute this strategy. When I arrived at the, at the White House in October of 2001, just a month after the events of 9-11, the President had just established the Office of Combating Terrorism. It was led by retired four-star Wayne Downing and was a small group of very dedicated and thoughtful public servants from the CIA, FBI, State, Coast Guard, Treasury, and the Department of Defense. I was the sole active duty military officer in the office. As a nation, we were completely unprepared to deal with what we saw as a pan-surgency, a global jihadist movement. We weren't organized, equipped, trained, or educated to fight what started as al-Qaeda and grew to the Taliban, al-Qaeda in Iraq, al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, al-Qaeda in the Islamic lands of the Maghreb, Abu Sayyaf, Tariq al-Talabani, -Tab al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, and more. In the early days of the Office of Combating Terrorism, we hosted the Threat Matrix meetings. It later became a TV show. I thought it was very interesting. The threat matrix, these meetings were held in the White House Situation Room, and we convened all the three-letter agencies to look at the national and international threats that confronted us. I remember with great frustration how none of the agencies would offer any real insights because they didn't trust the other elements of the government. We had a big Hollywood Squares, and I remember General Downing would turn and he would go, uh, FBI, let's have a report, and the FBI would say, uh, sir, nothing, nothing significant to report today. CIA, 
Uh, sir, nothing, uh, nothing significant to report. Defense. Uh, sir, we, we really haven't seen anything. And it went on and on and on. Well, two years later, when I was working for Stan McChrystal, General Stan McChrystal, the Joint Special Operations Command, we developed the same sort of threat matrix meeting, but he shamed the agencies into joining us on this similar threat matrix video teleconference. And we had the same problem. Nobody would talk. Stan got so hacked off, he went to the heads of all the agencies and said, I've got young men and women dying in combat. If you don't come to the table and give us the intelligence we need to get the job done, then their deaths rest on your shoulders. And I will tell you, I think that was a seminal moment, a watershed moment in how we transition as an interagency. Now, it took us years to build an effective interagency network. But when I left last year, I can tell you that never, never in the history of the United States has there been such collaboration. CIA and FBI talk every day. They have liaison officers at the highest levels to ensure the information is being relayed. Across the intel community, every agency works to get the right intelligence into the hands of those that need it. There's very little parochialism when it comes to the men and women in the fight and getting them what they need. Today, the interagency collaboration gives us an unprecedented ability to understand the enemy's plans. And we don't get it right every time, and Paris is an indication of that. But what the American people rarely see are the potential threats that are being stopped every single day. And as transparent as we like to be as a country, it's important that you don't see how a lot of that unfolds. But I will tell you, every single day, the intel community, the FBI and the law enforcement communities, the folks that we have over in State Department overseas are stopping threats to our interests every single day. We've also changed how we interact with our allies. Immediately after 9-11, frankly, we continued to hold vital in intelligence from our allies. We were rightfully concerned about sources and methods. But over time, we have developed dozens of new protocols that allow us to exchange intelligence necessary to help our friends and as well to help us. We have develop, developed incredibly strong professional and personal relationships with our Arab and European allies. They know how we fight on the battlefield, and they know what is expected of them when they join us. I will tell you, when I was at Special Operations Command Europe, we established the NATO Special Operations Force Command, NATO Soft Command. And interestingly enough, the 22 nations in NATO, they didn't want to see us do this. They didn't want special operations pulling together as an entity, and we had to fight through a lot of the historic NATO concerns. And we did that, and we built, frankly, the first campus and the first agency within NATO since 1967. And now we have 22 countries that have special operations forces that are part of this NATO Special Operations Command. And we share intelligence, and we share tactics, techniques, and procedures in the special operations world in a way that has never been done before. That force is available in Mali, and of course, you've, if you've Paid attention, you've seen the events that happened in Mali today. That force is available everywhere in the world because you have these 22 nations that have people that are spread out across the world. They're not just in France. They're not just in Germany. Like us, they deploy globally, and we have an incredible network. Today, we also have the finest military I think the world has ever seen. The young men and women who serve are all volunteers, and they really do. They come with a sense of purpose and patriotism that inspires all of us who have served with them. Our command structure has been flattened to allow us to move at the speed of war. In my vision brief uh, last week that Steve was talking about, I talked about how we have changed the hierarchy of the military, that we used to be very hierarchical, but when 9-11 happened, we had to flatten the chain of command because, frankly, you had young captains, young non-commissioned officers out there that were doing the work that used to be relegated to colonels and generals, and we had to rely on them. And we realized that the power of a single individual in an embassy someplace or out on the battlefield and the information they could, could convey was essential to everybody in the network. And you couldn't have you know, the captain who had to report to the major, who had to report to the lieutenant colonel, who had to report to the colonel, who had to report to the general, who had to report to the admiral. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way in the combat that we're, folks, that we're faced today. So flattening that bureaucracy, building that collaboration, not just in the military, but across the interagency was key. And so things have changed. You look at our military kind of prior to 9-11, it was built to fight a major regional conflict, an MRC. We weren't structured, trained, equipped, or educated really in counterterrorism or, or counterinsurgency or terrorism. Now, we in the special operations community were, but of course what you found very quickly in Iraq and Afghanistan 
is we relied on the young Marines and the young infantry and the, uh, and the folks that came from the other services to do counterinsurgency, and in some cases to do counterterrorism. We weren't equipped to do that. Today, we have, as I said, the finest military in the world. Everything about how we do business has changed. We now have highly mobile armored vehicles. We have new small arms and heavy weapon systems that operate in an urban environment and can operate in a long-range desert environment or mountain environment where we find our enemy. Again, we have command and control systems that link the higher headquarters all the way down to the foxhole. Now, some people say, well, that, that can be intrusive. But the way we've learned to utilize it, it's not intrusive, it's responsive. So if that young sergeant in the foxhole someplace says, I need a picture of, I need support from, that person no longer has to go up this long chain of command. It is immediately relayed to a larger network, and that network immediately reacts. But probably most importantly, the majority of the soldiers serving today, the vast majority, they've been in combat. They know what combat is like. They know the enemy. So we're not starting at 9-11. We are starting almost 15 years after 9-11, and we know the enemy well. Additionally, as I said, we have this network in place around the world, because frankly, the threat isn't localized. What we saw routinely was al-Qaeda in Pakistan talking to al-Qaeda in Iraq, who was talking to uh, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic lands of the Maghreb, or Al-Qaeda in, in, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula, who was talking to Boko Rome, who was talking to Al-Shabaab. They had this network. The enemy is networked both physically and virtually. But guess what? We are as well now. Now there are liaison officers in all of our embassies, and they know how to share information. They know how to share information across the intelligence community. They know how to share information with our allies. The Treasury Department, they know how to cut off the funds. Where we, where we are having state-supported terrorism, uh, where we find elements that are using the conventional, or in some cases the non-conventional banking system, the Treasury knows how to go after them. State Department knows how to put diplomatic pressure on unwilling or weak-kneed nations. The CIA and the FBI know how to leverage their counterparts to support the overseas efforts. Again, we know all this because we've been fighting this enemy since 9-11. However, there is one area, frankly, where we still struggle, and that's the American people. At the end of the day, the American people have got to be committed to this fight. They have to see the threat, frankly, as I've seen it over the last 14 years, as those that have been fighting it over the last 14 years. They have to understand that this fight will be long and costly, costly both in terms of money and in terms of human life. The American people must be prepared to inflict casualties and take casualties. We must be prepared to endure the wrath of world opinion because war is dirty, and it is brutal, and it is costly. And to think otherwise is just to be plain naive. The president and his national security team have to understand that the nation wants or that the na nation demands action against these barbarians. So how do we implement this strategy today? Well, first and foremost, I believe we must put the full might of the U.S. military and our allies into defeating ISIS. This means re-engagement in Iraq. This means boots on the ground in Iraq, Syria, Yemen, North Africa, Somalia, and keep a remaining force in Afghanistan. We have the manpower, we have the resources, and we have the experience, and don't let anybody tell you differently. This also means using every element of national power to cut off the flow of money, to restrict their movement, to attack their perverted ideology, to garner support from the decent and strong moderate Muslims. This also means finding a way to address the mass migration so that we show compassion to the innocent that must accompany our ruthlessness against the guilty. In the end, we know the right strategy. It is continuous and direct action on the extremists until they have no more capacity and no more reach. It will be a generational fight, but if we don't take it on now, then we should not be surprised when the barbarians are at our gate and we're wondering how they got here. So thank you all very much. I appreciate the great work all of you are doing and your interest in national security. And Steve, I'm certainly prepared to take uh, some questions. So with that, thank you. OK, please, fire away. If not, I'm going to ask one of these young cadets here to ask a question, and you don't want to, that poor, you don't want to embarrass that poor cadet. So somebody help him out here. Any questions? Yes, I I have one. Uh, 
here, Raven, Admiral oh, sorry. Yeah, please. McRaven. Uh, you referred repeatedly to uh, the enemy and to terrorism. One of the intellectual problems we have is that those, in effect, are pronouns with multiple antecedent uh, nouns. Could you give us your view as to exactly who the enemy in Syria is and whether that includes al-Nusra and its associates? Yeah, sure. I mean, it, it's... You know, when I look at the enemy, and you can slice it and dice it a hundred different ways, and is it the radical Islam, is it, I mean, at the end of the day, I really believe it's the barbarians against the civilized world. And, and that may be too black and white for a lot of folks. But when you look at al-Nusra, when you look at ISIS, I mean, ISIS comes from al-Qaeda in Iraq. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was part of al-Qaeda in Iraq. And, and yet I think that ISIS, there is a, a special evil about ISIS that, uh, I mean, Steve and all these guys that have been involved in this war can tell you, I mean, we've seen some pretty brutal stuff. I've never seen anything quite like what ISIS is doing. Uh, I contend that they do it because they have invited, you know, young men and some young women in so that they can act out their greatest perversions. It's not about an ideology. It's not about the caliphate, I don't believe. I believe that they bring people in because they realize they can kill they can rape with impunity, they can torture, they can do these barbaric things, and they can do it all in the name of Islam. Um, and so, you know, these are uncivilized people. And they, it's not just al-Nusra, it's not just uh, ISIS, it is Boko Haram. And you see Boko Haram, you know, stole 270 young ladies out of Shabbat in northern Nigeria. And again, you know, sexually abused them, sold them off. I mean, these are barbarians. So I think the clear line here is uncivilized and civilized. And the civilized nations, I think, to come to get, they need to come together. I don't think we need to put a name on it. People grasp for a name. Uh, is it, you know, radicals? Are they extremists? Of course they are. That's all part of the context in which they operate. But to me, they're just barbarians. They need to be destroyed, pure and simple. Other questions? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I would appreciate if you could share your views on the impact of the media and the political campaigns on whether it's negative or positive or neutral on the effects of both uh, support for some of these strategies here as well as globally. Yeah, well, you know, let me start by saying uh, obviously it is a political season. Um, yeah, you know, I have the, the greatest respect uh, for the president and his national security team, and I've had an opportunity to work both in the Bush White House and, and obviously with the Obama administration. Yeah, it, it's an incredibly difficult job uh, being in the White House and looking at all the, uh, the factors that influence your decision every day. Uh, I do think, however, that the dialogue that is occurring now, part of it because of the political season, but part of it because of what uh, ISIS and others are doing, is an important national dialogue. But as, I, but as I said in my remarks, this isn't about the President of the United States. This is about the American people. This is about the American people, in my opinion, waking up and understanding that we have a real threat here. And you can, you can leave it to the philosophers to decide whether or not you know, the enemy ought to be couched in certain terms. What I'm telling you from my military background is we have a clear and definable enemy. It's, it's pretty straightforward right now, and we need to do something about it. And I believe we need to commit all of our resources to destroy this enemy. Now, um, that's a dialogue that has to occur. The president can't do that unless he feels like the American people want that to happen. So when you see what's happening in the political season, and I think it would probably happen to maybe to a lesser degree where it's not a, a campaign season, uh, but the dialogue is important, and the American people have got to make their voice heard. It can't just be coming from politicians and talking heads on Fox or CNN. Uh, but I do think the dialogue and the national dialogue is important for this. Yes, sir. No, I, I, so the question was, do I see boots on the ground as uniquely U.S.? What I would tell you is, I would hope it's not uniquely U.S. I think now what you have, of course, is the French are more than happy to partner with us, the Jordanians. Uh, we have some great allies, the Emiratis. Um, but at the end of the day, if the U.S. doesn't take the lead, and, and I hear this all the time is, it's not our fight. 
let the Arabs solve this problem. It's an Arab conflict. It's an Arab problem. We can say that all we want. But until the United States gets out there and leads, because we are the only country. I mean, we have great allies and the Brits and the French and others. We are the only country that has the resources to be able to take that leadership position. And the other countries know that. So I would hope that as we go after ISIS, both in Iraq and in Syria and wherever they may exist, and it's not just ISIS. As I said, it is this network. It is Al-Qaeda in Yemen. It is, it is you know, Al-Qaeda in, uh, in lower Algeria and Mali. And it is Boko Haram. There are bad people out there. If we don't do something about it, we are going to pay the price. You know, you either pay it now or you pay it later, but you're going to have to pay it. Um, so I do believe we can build a coalition. But as, as was said in the strategy of 2002, if they don't come with us, then we ought to go it alone because it is in our national interest to do that. Yes, sir. Yeah, you know, the great thing about this is, you know, this is the United States of America and the First Amendment plays out no more importantly than here on a campus. And, and just because I'm the chancellor of the University of Texas doesn't mean you take away my First Amendment rights. I've been asked to come here and talk about this is Bill McRaven's opinion. This is not the opinion of the Board of Regents or the University of Texas system. But I think I have a right to make my opinions known. They've invited me to, do here, to be here and I'm happy to do it. Yes, sir. Sir, what do you think is the opportunity cost for us to pursue this particular yeah. fight so single-mindedly? There are other threats. There are sure. other problems Absolutely. to you politically. So what are we committing ourselves to not addressing? Yeah, you know, I think that's a great question. And, and again, I think this has to be part of the discussion, is what, what won't we do if we focus on this? And I do think we have to look at the priority problems around the world and, and domestically. Uh, yeah, again, as, as I've said before, my expectation is, you know, going into a fight like this will cost us billions of dollars. It will cost us more lives, our great young men and women that are out there. It's the nature of war. So we have to decide, and it gets back to the discussion about the American people. The American people have to decide whether or not this fight is important to them. And they will have to decide, I think, in working through their, uh, you know, their congressmen and their senators and, and their elected officials, what the priority is. Is this a priority for the United States? Um, if it's not, then we, the American people, will make that decision. Uh, there are some things that will obviously have to be uh, delayed if we're going to you know, take this effort on. I'm not sure I can tell you what a list of those things are. Um, but what I can tell you is, as you begin to see how not taking action draws away from our time right now, I think we would find that taking action probably isn't going to divert us from doing too many more things that not taking action has caused us to focus on. Uh, I got one right here for you. Sure, right. Uh, you talked uh, in your prepared remarks um, about how our national security system has evolved and adapted since 9-11. Uh, in what ways have you seen the enemy adapt and evolve since 9-11, especially that they're able to still stage mass casualty attacks like yeah. we saw in Paris? Yeah, great question, Will. And, uh, you know, this I get back to this idea of the network. Um, I, I will tell you, when we first got to Iraq, uh, you know, we thought, we, the special operations community, and I think the, uh, the Army thought we were fighting these kind of pockets of resistance. You know, we, we would see the enemy in Mosul, or we would see them in Baghdad, or we would see them, you know, out in the desert. And, and, it, and maybe they were isolated at first, but then they began to realize that if they communicated, you know, the, the road from Mosul down to Baghdad could be used as a way to move arms and, uh, and bombs in. And then, of course, we began to see them using facilitators in Syria, and then facilitators in Kuwait and then facilitators in North Africa. And before long, their network, which of course was not constrained by the kind of bureaucracies that we have, uh, their network expanded very quickly. Um, and at one point in time, I used to give this brief, uh, highly classified back then, but it, it showed the actual conversations between key leaders all around the globe. And I remember giving it to a very senior group one time, who, and we were in the middle of this debate about were they a network or were they not a network? And so I walked through the intelligence of which none of it was Department of Defense intelligence, because I knew they'd think I was trying to sell a used car to them. 
And so I said, here is, the, here is what we're seeing. And I mean, I'm telling you, people went, whoa. I said, no, look, some of these are stronger than others. Some of them are really direct contacts. Some of them are tangential. But there's a network out there, and it's functioning as a network. And that really began to drive us to, again, build this network to defeat a network. Stan McChrystal's old line about we're going to build a network to defeat a network. But that network is in place. My concern after we pulled out of Iraq and as we have drawn down in Afghanistan, those relationships that we used to have that were, that were brought together because we were fighting this war have begun to dissipate a little bit. Um, but it's still there. So we need to make sure that that network is humming in order to be able to deal with this threat that is clearly networked. They're using social media. I mean, you know all the ways that they're, that they're facilitating this. But again, somebody, I, I guess it was Charlie Rose the other day, asked me, why does it take so much for us to fight this enemy? And I said, because they have no rules. They don't have to follow international conventions. They don't have to follow rules of engagement. They don't have to follow the, land, the law of armed conflict. They can move at whatever pace they can move at because there is no rules, there is no bureaucracy, it's just about creating destruction. And so we, for all the right reasons, the civilized world has to follow these protocols because they are important for our humanity. But we are fighting these barbarians that don't have to do that, and therefore it's a much more complex fight. Yes, sir. Sir, you, uh, you certainly leave open uh, the possibility for an international coalition, and so I'm interested Absolutely. to hear uh, what your thoughts on what that coalition might look like. Ought we support an Article 5 request from France uh, to, through NATO? Should we support uh, a UN Security Council resolution? Uh, should we be working bilaterally with the French? Uh, should it be a multilateral ad hoc coalition of the willing? Y your thoughts, sir? Yeah, I would tell you all of the above, any and all of the above. Uh, as I said, at the end of the day, uh, as you know, Captain Marshallette, I mean, we have built these relationships. You know, we didn't have much of a relationship with the French. Uh, until all of a sudden the French and many years ago started taking hits in Mali. And the U.S. Special Operations and the French Special Operations became very close. And, and we began to build these relationships that frankly were unparalleled. They didn't have a whole, we didn't have a whole lot of papers, no memorandums of understanding. We just built this kind of informal network. And then of course as we developed the, the NATO Special Operations Command, we began to formalize that. I think any opportunity, however people want to come, to go after this enemy, again, whether it's Article 5, whether it is, you know, uh, a lesser uh, coalition, it's all good because the more we have engaged against the enemy, the better we'll be. And again, we'll build these relationships, important relationships for later on because this fight's not going away. Even if we, you know, get rid of uh, a threat today, I, I think we're going to see this going on for a while. There is a lot of talk about the messaging. How do you counter the messaging? And of course, now I, I'm finding this very interesting that you know, 15 years into this fight, we're almost starting at ground zero again, or we're starting at square one, I should say. Ground zero may be a bad, um, but maybe we are starting at ground zero. But I hear people raising the exact same issues that we raised here. It was about you know, how, do you, how do you counter this message out there? Where do we get the moderate imams to come forward? And they're saying, look, you can't destroy this problem until you take care of the underlying causes, until you address the message and the ideology. Absolutely. That's got to be part of it. But guess what? We've been trying to do that for the last 15 years. It's hard. It's hard. And this is why this strategy, even early on, recognized that there are things you need to do. You need to build coalitions. You need to work uh, with your allies. You need to do everything possible. But what works? is direct and continuous pressure. Because when you keep direct and continuous pressure on a threat, then it can't maneuver. We did it in Yemen very successfully for several years, and then we took our foot off the gas. And no sooner did we take our foot off the gas than within a year, the threat had, had grown up again. And people say, well, we just can't do this forever. Oh, yeah, we can. If it's a threat to the United States, then we need to be prepared to do it however long it takes. Um, again, we get back to terms like, is this the new normal? I think it's the old normal. So, yeah, anybody that thinks this is going to be easy, then you haven't spent much time in this fight. It's not going to be easy. Yes, sir. Chancellor, I guess I'm sort of astonished at some of the questions after last Friday of the explosions in Beirut and then the slaughters in Paris. Uh, when you wrote that strategy, it was broadly to deal with but you then set priorities. Right. And you went to Afghanistan, you went right. to Al-Qaeda to start. 
I'd make the case to you, ISIS and ISIS now, before they do the same attacks in the U.S. Right. that they've already done, is the first priority. Yeah, I, I do think, uh, Admiral, I mean, you, you have to prioritize, I mean, as we say in the military, what's your 25-meter target? Uh, in, in other words, what's closest to India? And right now, ISIS is that threat. I mean, Al-Qaeda, and, you know, when you look at what the intel community did against Al-Qaeda, Al core Al-Qaeda has been diminished so badly, it, it's essentially, uh, you know, maybe I should not go so far as to say defeated, but to, to suffice to say, core Al-Qaeda and the threat we used to see from Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda core, it, it's just not there anymore. How did we do that? Constant pressure on the Al-Qaeda network, constant. So I think as we look at ISIS, there is a way to do this. You can, you can destroy the leadership, you can put pressure, you can limit their flow of money into them, you can continue to compress them until frankly they can be handled you know, locally, and whether it's ISIS or whether it's Al-Qaeda in Yemen or whatever it happens to be. Is it easy? Absolutely not. But I would agree with you that our, our first target ought to be ISIS. But at the same time, we do have the resources to be able to look at a Boko Haram and an AQIM. And an a I mean, we can't ignore these other threats because when you look at the, uh, the underwear bomber, uh, Umar Farouk Abdullah Matabla, the cartridge bomb that could have taken down airlines, this came from Yemen. And if you go back and look at how Umar Farouk Abdullah Matabla was radicalized, I mean, he came from Nigeria. Nobody knew who he was. He shows up in Yemen. Uh, Alaki and Al Siri uh, radicalize him, and the next thing you know, he's on a plane, you know, bound for Detroit. So this idea that we only focus on ISIS, I do think we need to put our our first uh, and the bulk of our effort there. But frankly, we need to rely on our allies and others to go out to keep these other threats tamped down. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, you started out by saying that the military policy would only be part of a portfolio right. of, of yep. solutions, and then at the end you you gave what, what amounted to almost a declaration of war. My question is this, um, you talked about American legitimacy and what are the things that the United States could do to enhance that legitimacy? I mean, re recently there was uh, uh, Air, Air Force pilots who talked about the right. high proportion of collateral damage. We know about rendition, torturing. Right. What are things that the United States can do to enhance its soft power, to reduce the le legitimacy of the extremists and to en enhance its own? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I mean, part of this, though, gets back to the facts. And what I saw in Iraq and Afghanistan is the enemy very quickly seizes on any opportunity it can not to tell the truth and to use that as a vehicle to recruit more. I can't tell you the number of times in Afghanistan where we, we were accused of civilian casualties that there were no civilian casualties, in some cases, no casualties at all. It gets back to this idea that they don't have to follow the rules. All they have to do is lie, lie, lie. Now, that's not to say we haven't had civilian casualties. Absolutely we have. But I will tell you, in the history of warfare, and I would ask any military historian to go back and check, in the history of warfare, this has been the most surgical war we have ever had. Drone strikes, and everybody gets on drone strikes. Let me tell you, drone strikes have saved tens of thousands of Iraqis and Afghans. Because when we target, and people don't understand how drone strikes work. There are about 100 people sitting in a room that will watch a target for hours, days, weeks, months sometime to make sure that we are targeting only the individual we're going after so we know where every single woman and child is so that when we finally make that strike, we are striking only the bad guy that we have solid intelligence on. It's not perfect. But I got to tell you, in the old days, you know, go back to Vietnam, Korea, World War II, any of those wars, we have just leveled the whole place. We don't do that anymore because we believe in the law of armed conflict. We believe in rules of engagement. We believe in protecting civilians for that exact reason. I will tell you, I had facilities where we had detainees. And the first thing I did, the first time I walked into a facility, I said, you know, I, I don't particularly like this. We're going to clean this up and we're going to make absolutely certain we do everything by the book and we treat these folks with as much respect as we can. And in the end, what we found is we could do that. We could do that, and, and guess what? They love to talk. I, I never quite figured that out. It didn't require any pressure. It required you walking in, and they were proud of what they had done. I had one guy who had committed 37. He had been the mastermind behind 37 bombs in Baghdad that had killed hundreds of Iraqis, and he was proud of it, and he wanted to tell us all about it, and this was common. It's hard to appreciate, again, 
people want to talk about the ideology, and clearly there will be those out there that will say why this ideology is important, what the Taliban's trying to do, where ISIS is trying to go, how they're trying to reinvent the caliphate. You know, I'm kind of beyond all that. Um, I've spent a lot of time, I, it's not that some of them aren't truly committed and believe this, but I think the bulk of them are fighters and you know, they, are, they are left to their own devices because they like to do what they like to do. They like to kill, they like to rape, they like to maim, they like to burn people, and there's no rules to stop them. And they blanket it all in Islam because their leadership says they can do that. That's what we need to talk to. I will tell you the ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross, they were probably my closest partners. And I made sure every single time we did a mission, it was in accordance with every rule and regulation out there. I was probably the most inspected organization when I had my three-star organization of any in the military. And so this belief that we are out there kind of cavalierly running around, killing people, torturing people, it's just not true. Now again, war's not easy. People die. Good people die sometimes. But I gotta tell you, we put more effort into this war so that we don't generate moderate Muslims turning radical, but it's hard because they don't have to tell the truth, and, and we do. Yes, sir, Tim. Chancellor, could you talk about how you think the Russian presence in Syria yeah. affects the situation? Yeah, well, it clearly affects the situation, Tim. I mean, it's, uh, the question was uh, you know, the Russian situation. Um, you know, it's, uh, I mean, I could go back to Crimea. I mean, my, my belief, and I've, I've said it publicly before, um, I mean, uh, Putin's a bully. I mean, it's plain and simple. Um, and I, I'm not a Russian expert, but I've become an expert on bullies. And if you allow bullies to continue to push, they're going to continue to push in the direction they want. So they're in Syria right now. You know, they are, they're obviously propping up Assad. Um, so I think whatever partnership we build with the Russians has got to be a partnership based on equal strength. Because if this is about the Russian agenda, vice what we think is the international agenda, which is best for, for us, uh, but if we come in with anything short of, again, equal representation, then we'll be right where Putin wants us to be. And we can't do that. Nobody does well by that. Now, can the Russians help us out? I think they can. Um, but there's a lot of work to be had before I think we get to that point. Yes, sir. Public opinion and the need to shape public opinion. Um, and then you said that the American pub public has to get behind, right. behind this kind of thing. And uh, if we look back in history, uh, FDR shaped public opinion. Right both before and after Absolutely. the war and during right. the war. And even as now, George W. Bush shaped public opinion right. at one point. But if we look at every politician today, maybe ex except for one, who's trying to run for president or who is the president, they keep saying that we're gonna form an alliance and that all of these countries are gonna put people, uh, put boots on the ground in front of us. Right. But you say public opinion needs to do the exact, a different strategy, that we need to be in front and we need to lead. And you're not a shy and retiring guy, and you've been in the, at, at the top of this government. Why can't we convince our government to, to be honest with us and come up with a strategy like perhaps the one that you articulated earlier? Yeah, you know, um, let me tell you, though, uh, about our government, which sometimes uh, isn't fully appreciated. The great thing about being in the American military is you have an opportunity to talk to the president and the national security team. And you have an opportunity to disagree with them. You have an opportunity to present your case. And as we in the military will do, we will argue all the way up to the point until the decision is made. And then our job is to salute smartly and move out. And I think we have done that very well. So I get back to my earlier point, which is, it's not about the American military. The American military will do what the American people want it to do. The American people are reflected in the President of the United States and his national security team in this case. So you have clearly a portion of the American people that absolutely support where the, where the President stands right now. And so I, I would tell you, you know, this is a discussion the American people have to have uh, and to determine whether or not now is the time to, as you said, kind of flip the, uh, the solution set. 
what I can tell you from my experience in Iraq, Afghanistan, North Africa, all around the place, is that if we don't lead, it's very difficult to get people to follow. And the people we would like to have lead, and again, I hear this all the time, well, we need to get the Saudis out there, and we need to get the, the Jordanians, and we need to get the Iraqis. That's great. Let's get all of them we can. But if you think the Saudis or the Iraqis are going to be able to lead a concerted effort against ISIS in Iraq or Syria or anywhere else, they do not have the capability to do that. That's not to say they don't have some incredibly courageous you know, officers and enlisted folks. Uh, they do. I mean, again, I've spent time with all these armies. They have you know, young men and women that are just as passionate and just as patriotic as any American, any European. That's, people fail to see that sometimes. You, you kind of watch the five minute segment on TV and you think you understand that the Iraqi army said, oh my God, we're gonna throw up our arms and leave. Um, you know, a lot of armies around the world have done that in, in the course of history. There are some magnificent and heroic Iraqis out there, Iraqi military, Afghan military, I've seen it time and time again. Um, but right now, I think what they need is somebody to, as we used to say in the Middle East, be shoulder to shoulder with them. Uh, in this case, maybe our shoulder needs to be a little further out. Um, but I think if we do that, we will find they will be willing partners with us. Because while I don't think the ISIS is an existential threat today, it is certainly an existential threat to the Iraqis. It may not be an existential threat today to the United States, but if we don't do something about it soon, we will find that our interests overseas are, are under attack and our interests within the homeland will be equally under attack. And imagine if the airline industry were to shut down. Imagine if the mass migration continues into Europe and the euro begins to take a hit. I mean, the scenarios that can play out, and I don't want to fear monger, but I'm telling you, this, you know, when you have a million plus people that are pressurizing Jordan and Lebanon. If King Abdullah, who is one of our very best allies in the Middle East, were to fall because the over two million refugees that are coming into Jordan cannot be managed, we lose one of the best allies we have. If Lebanon falls and Hezbollah really takes over Lebanon, guess what? The second and third order effects of what could happen in the Levant, in the, in the Middle East area, into North Africa, into Southern Europe, it could be pretty dramatic. So, as I said, there are no easy answers. Uh, and it will not be an easy fight and it will not be a short fight. But it really is about the American people. It's not about the President of the United States. It's about the American people deciding whether or not this is the trade-off they need. This is worth the effort we're going to put into it. Um, and that requires people like you, requires forums like this. It requires engagement, as we see on TV, I think, to, gener to generate the uh, national narrative and figure out where we want to go as a nation. And with that, I will step down. Thank you very much.